Hello everyone. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about nihilism. In particular, I wanted to uh, negate nihilism through nihilism itself. A little theory I created. But first I'll talk about what is nihilism. So nihilism is the idea that life is meaningless. And then of course the act of nihilism is uh, uh, the postulation that life is worthless. But generally speaking, uh, those who come to this conclusion that life is worthless come to it um, f through the same means as those who say it's meaningless. And generally these are two, two basic uh, synonyms for meaninglessness and worthlessness. Uh, which itself is an erroneous uh, idea, because if something is meaningless it does not mean it has no, uh, no worth in it. Not like you can't extract value from it. But what is meaninglessness here in this um, uh, scenario? There is first the idea that uh, the definition of meaninglessness being um, purposelessness. That we are not designed with some purpose or duty to carry out. Uh, and that itself is false, which we'll get to in a moment. But then the other idea of uh, meaninglessness is that it is impossible for us human beings, rational conscious organisms, to extract meaning uh, from life. To make of life anything that matters. And uh, first I'll negate this idea because uh, value and worth is obviously subjective. And so if you are incapable of extracting value or worth from life, it says little about life, but a lot about the nihilist himself, the individual, who is incapable of doing this. Uh, animals have no problem with it, and most human beings have no problem with it either. But the nihilist does. And of course, if you want to talk about a uh, purpose, the very fact that we have instincts is proof that uh, that we are given a purpose, that we have some sort of duty to carry out. We have instincts to survive and to reproduce foremost, but almost any instinct we have uh, is itself uh, part of some sort of purpose or duty that we have as organisms, as human beings. And some sort of global homo worldwide sort of unity or you know some sort of moral sort of uh, rationale is not part of this because we have no instinct towards this now I would go further and I would say nihilism itself um, it, it follows a circular logic you see uh, the nihilist says that well the mantra goes that life is shit and then you die but of course, uh, I would believe uh, that uh, a more uh, correct mantra for the nihilist to take, if he was a true nihilist, and not simply a lover of tragedy, which I believe most so-called nihilists are, they are lovers of tragedy. But a truer mantra would be, life is shit and then you die, so what? Because if life is meaningless, then the meaninglessness itself must also be meaningless. Um, and it really is peculiar how a nihilist can say that everything is worthless except the idea that it's worthless, that you hold on to, that you cling to. And why does a nihilist uh, uh, put so much effort and passion into um, this idea, this concept, most important concept he has, of this meaninglessness? Why his whole philosophy weighs on it? It's due to a sort of uh, a love of tragedy. Everybody wants to desire themselves to everybody desires themselves to be a tragic figure. They want to see reflected in the universe the same suffering and pain which they as an organism, as a living being, experience. They want to believe that uh that there's that they are hard done by in a way. They desire to pity themselves. Now, here I believe is the, the link between the nihilist and the Christian. Because much in the same way that the nihilist seeks for the universe to uh, have that same pain and suffering as they experience, to see reflected in the world around them the same uh, trivial strife that they uh, have imbued within them. The Christian, too, cries out for his higher God. He wants to die so the higher God can pat him on the head and say, There, there, you know, you suffered uh, virtuously. Now have paradise for all eternity. The nihilist himself and the Christian 
both uh, see life as a tragedy. And they see uh, themselves as some sort of hero in this tragedy, who is sort of, whose very uh, act of living is some sort of revolutionary act. It's the most sickly, decadent idea I've ever heard in my life. Um, that suffering is, uh, and, and just living is suffering, and suffering is virtue, and that uh, you will be rewarded for it. Like, uh, life and the universe will be grateful to you in some way. Uh, that is a decadent idea. Now, how nihilism came about uh, today, in today's day. You see, before Christianity, um, people did not have uh, a nihilistic outlook on life. There were, say, the natural and the unnatural elements of the philosophy of the time. The natural being things like um, like passions and uh, sexuality and um, uh, an adoration of nature and things like this. They were sort of um, the animalistic elements of human philosophy. Uh, what we love, what we strive for, basically, what we are passionate about. Then of course there came the unnatural, which was um, say the sciences and uh, uh, the whole sort of esoteric spirituality and philosophies which were already around in ancient Greece and these two things were already always part of paganism in some way sort of the higher and the lower forms when Christianity came um, it built this morality to seek a world of truth in a sense and um, truth and meaning became intrinsically tied to what is essentially a moral assertion that was designed to make uh, weak and slavish people feel more comfortable. The harsh and cruel life that paganism gave people was insufficient for the moral man. Moral man uh, reinvented truth. He created this idea of, uh, of uh, a metaphysical truth which uh, binds everything together. I would say that in paganism, there was a physical truth. Um, that uh, the afterlife was life itself. That uh, there was no beyond. And that um, what later would become known as metaphysics were simply a part of the physical world. It was not an idea that there was a, a truth sort of lurking behind the physical realm that needed to be sought after. But rather it was that um, this truth was a part of the physical world, it was a physical truth. The gods did not live in the beyond, they lived in the physical realm itself, they were part of nature. Same thing with magic, it was uh, a part of the spirit, a part of uh, nature, and not some sort of metaphysical force which was sort of wrapped around everything. But as people, uh, as the values that Christianity created um, progressed, it was this value of truthfulness, which itself was the undoing of, um, of the meaning which Christianity gave people. Because uh, as the sciences progressed, for example, one can see very clearly that um, the more you seek for truth, uh, the more questions simply appear. And you realize that um, the truth is not some sort of goal that the world is, is, uh, is moving towards. But rather, the more you learn, and the more you discover, and the more you explore, simply the more questions you have to ask. And a sort of uh, oxymoronic or paradoxical situation emerges where the more truth you find, uh, the further you, you realize you are away from the truth. Truth at some point became impossible. And this value of truthfulness, uh, once rendered impossible, um, the value disappears. But let's look at other values. Um, I believe the Romantic period also created a... Um, uh, it, it was one push away from the, the, the medieval Christianism. And it was one push towards uh, the Christian morality being a part of society even after belief in God was impossible. If you look at something like historiography, the Romantics had uh, an idea of the practical history. That history must always teach us a lesson. And as history progresses and you witness events firsthand, you realize that the fabled elements 
uh, that sort of Romanesque, uh, fabulous sort of twist on history, which we learn about from the past. We learn about every event in the form of a fable. And I would say in the case of World War II, people still learn about it like it's a fable, like some primordial battle between good and evil. But uh, as people experienced history firsthand, with this, this practical history became impossible because they saw firsthand the multitude of um, different uh, events and their consequences which resulted in history, there being no real rhyme or rhythm to it, how chance was so prevalent and how the fable really needs to be created afterwards and the fable itself was fictitious. It's easy to look at a blurry event in history in the past